What is going on with the New Orleans Pelicans? Does anyone have any answers to what this team is, what this franchise is, what is going on in New Orleans? Because they're supposed to be a lot better than 15 and 22. They're not supposed to be getting blown out by the Minnesota Timberwolves who have a new head coach and haven't won a game in like 10 games under that new head coach. They shouldn't be losing to the Timberwolves twice on the season. The Pistons, the Kings, other bad teams, giving up 145 to the Chicago Bulls. They shouldn't be performances that any team in the NBA is having. And no other team in the NBA is having these kind of performances, apart from the Pelicans, who have enough talent to be in the playoff picture, yet they're just nowhere. They're not low enough to the point where they're getting a top pick, which they should not be. I'm not saying the Pelicans should be a top six, top five seed. I'm just saying they should be a lot closer to the playoff picture than 15 and 22. And it's like eight games behind a team like the Memphis Grizzlies, several games behind the Golden State Warriors, who are missing a key player and missed Draymond Green for a lot of the season like I'm just really frustrated with what this team is doing it makes no sense it's getting to the point where you just have to raise question marks over the management the general management and people in this organization we'll talk about the players as well because they don't get off scot-free either now before I do this if you could drop a like on the video and subscribe to the channel this is probably more of a rant because the Pelicans have just got to the point in time where I don't know what to say but just kind of this so dropping a like, subscribing to the channel. I make content like this every single day. It's free. It would be much appreciated. So I mentioned what their goals are for the season. It's fine if you don't want to make the playoffs, which you should because you've got Zion Williamson, a top 20, 25 player in the league. Brandon Ingram, top 30. Lonzo Ball's having a breakout season, playing really well. And you've got some solid role players. Sure, the team doesn't really fit well, which David Griffin, you haven't done the best job at that. But that's fine if you're not trying to make the playoffs or like you, you don't have to make the playoffs in our expectations. You just have to be competitive and you can't be the worst defense in the NBA over the last 25 to 30 games, the second worst on the season. But getting back to my point on the playoff picture, okay, say you don't want to make the playoffs, say you're not going to make the playoffs. Okay, then why is Nikhil Alexander-Walker, Jackson Hayes, Kyra Lewis, all going stretches of games where maybe one of them sees the floor. There's been stretches of games where guys have just been DNPs or played like two minutes a night. If you're not going to make the playoffs, if you're going with the youth movement, then go with the youth movement. Sit Eric Bledsoe. What has he done to deserve anything more than to be sat for someone like Kyra Lewis? Because when I see Eric Bledsoe playing, I mean, he came to play tonight. Two points, two rebounds, two assists, one of eight shooting. Eric Big man Bledsoe has been fantastic. The Bled Show. He came to play. But when I see him just kind of roaming around, doing nothing, chucking up bricks, being a liability, not even playing that great a defense when that's supposed to be his calling card, particularly when his offense stinks so much when they're just triple teaming Zion. Let's kick it out to an open Eric Bledsoe who's about 15 feet away from anyone in the vicinity of him. I saw crowd members closer to Eric Bledsoe than actual players because they're like, let's just see him shoot like he did in the playoffs last year. And well, yeah, he chucked up a ton of bricks like he consistently does. Don't let his three-point percentage fool you. I'm convinced that is just a glitch in the system. There's no way I've seen him shoot more than five or six threes and I've watched like every Pelicans game. So I'm convinced that's a glitch and his three-point percentage is actually like 15, not 38. But why are you playing Eric Bledsoe instead of someone like Kyra Lewis? Nikhil Alexander-Walker had some good games. Then he kind of went a little bit cold-ish for a while and then he's out of the rotation now. He's kind of getting back into the rotation. Here you go. Just have a few crumbs every now and then, five to 10 minutes. Jackson Hayes, it took him playing incredibly well just to get five to 10 minutes over the last couple of games. It's one thing to be bad. It's another thing to just kind of be trying to compete, but still being bad when you've got players that mean you shouldn't be bad. And let's talk about Stan Van Gundy. It was a questionable coaching hire, and I think he's getting credit for some things that you shouldn't get credit for. You go to your job, you go to school, and you just kind of log onto your computer. You check the date, you check the time, you get a coffee. That's kind of what you have to do just to get started on your work job, and then maybe you log in one or two things of information, or you do the absolute obvious. Like you take a couple of calls. What am I trying to say? Stan Van Gundy is doing the absolute obvious and getting credit for it, except he's doing the absolute obvious about 30 games after everyone else sees that it's the absolute obvious. For example, Eric Bledsoe, primary initiator throughout the first 20 games of the season. Let's realize Lonzo Ball's a better playmaker, a better player, a better defender, someone that you want to have your franchise around more than Eric Bledsoe because he's younger, he fits with Zion Williamson and Brandon Ingram better. What about giving Zion the ability to playmake, to create in the pick and roll? People are giving him credit for that. 
okay, it took him like 15 to 20 games to realize you've got to do more than just give Zion the ball 10 times a match when he's your best offensive player and it's one of the best 10 offensive players in the NBA. Like, sure, it's good that he figured it out, but that's a coach's job. I'm not giving him credit for figuring out things that I could see and I'm not someone who pretends to be some kind of messiah when it comes to the NBA. I look at coaches like Nick Nurse and I'm like, yeah, I wasn't thinking of that. I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> and then I look at Sam Van Gundy things and I'm like, he's getting credit for doing that? He's getting credit for giving the ball to Lonzo Ball instead of Eric Bledsoe. He's getting credit for giving the ball to Zion Williamson to run the offense when he's your best offensive player. He's giving credit for finally going away from dribble handoffs at the top of the three-point line with um, Steven Adams and Brandon Ingram. I'd love to get credit for doing those kind of things in life where you just, oh, walk the dogs. Yes, everyone gives you a round of applause. No, you don't get credit for doing the bare minimum. And that's kind of what I've seen with Stan Van Gundy. And it's not just all on Van Gundy. I'm not going to say that. There are certain players, like Eric Bledsoe I mentioned, he just doesn't want to be there. I don't know where he wants to be because if he wants to be on a contender, like you're not going to a contender unless you want to be the 15th man on the bench. Jared Dudley's ahead of you in the pecking order on a contender. Like, what do you provide, Eric Bledsoe? If you want to be on a contender, you've got to play just a little bit better. Just a little bit better, Eric Bledsoe. Steven Adams, everyone likes Steven Adams. I mean, yeah, Steven Adams, of course, but he just doesn't fit the team. We thought at the time, and I thought, let's give him the benefit of the doubt. I can kind of see where he's going. Zion's not the best defender. Just bring a big body around him to kind of just be that guy who takes all the force and lets Zion do his thing offensively and to not be a liability in the paint defensively because he's not much of a rim protector. In theory... It's not a bad theory. The thing is with Steven Adams, and then when you have Zion, who's not the most agile for a four because he's 280 pounds, Brandon Ingram's not particularly agile as well because he's seven foot, and Eric Bledsoe doesn't play defense, even though he should because he just doesn't care. The thing is when you have all of that, your perimeter defense sucks. And I'm putting more of this on David Griffin than Stan Van Gundy. Although Stan Van Gundy did take a long time to realize that, hey, maybe give someone like Willie Hernan Gomez, Jackson Hayes more minutes because they can move their feet and probably reduce some of those Steven Adams minutes because he can't move his feet. And every time teams bring him out to the three-point line, they switch him onto a guard and he gets cooked. All the guys get caught trying to make rotation to get Steven Adams off that three-point shooter and then eventually they find an open shooter as a result. It's a knock-on effect from having Steven Adams. The reality is the idea behind bringing him in, yeah, it wasn't the worst idea. It's not as bad as some people would have you think. It just doesn't work at all. The personnel around Steven Adams defensively, and then offensively, obviously he's not a great fit. We knew that from the start, but we thought maybe he makes up for it defensively. No, he doesn't. What their idea was to protect the paint, they're like 13th in paint points, which is okay but they're like worst in the league in protecting the three-point line. At least that's what I see. Consistently teams are shooting like 50%. The Minnesota Timberwolves coming into the game, I think were the second worst three-point shooting team in the league, and they shot like 50% from three-point range. That's a consistent theme. It happens every single time the Pelicans play. It's like, oh, this team shoots 34% from three. Oh, this team is shooting 73% from three against the Pelicans. Yeah, it's because your defense sucks. Not enough communication as well. That's another thing. There's not really any on-court leadership. I mean, Brandon Ingram's a quiet guy. Lonzo Ball's a quiet guy. Zion Williamson's a quiet guy. Steven Adams is a quiet guy. Eric Bledsoe doesn't want to be there. JJ Reddick's on the bench. If he's even a vocal guy, I don't know. He's got a podcast, but I don't hear him talking. I don't see him talking. Maybe he does. I don't know with his team. There's no leadership but there's also no youth. Well, there is, but there's no like youth from Kyra Lewis and guys like you're playing the obvious youth. That's just your best players. You don't get credit for playing Zion, Brandon Ingram and Lonzo Ball because they're young. Let's talk about potential options as to how to fix this team because it's all well me just kind of ranting about all the issues with this team. The fact that yes, they're a great offense and I've talked about how they're a great offense and I didn't give Stan Van Gundy too much credit because I don't think he did anything crazy. I think you've got an offensive engine unlike anyone else in the league in Zion Williamson who can create for others, create for himself, has gravity inside where you can have Steven Adams with the ball and there's still like two players vigilant of Zion Williamson. You can have Brandon Ingram with the ball and there's still players vigilant of Zion Williamson, even if he's right next to him. Most times, if you had someone right next to the dunker's spot players would rotate over and double team someone like Brandon Ingram or get in the way but they're still focused on Zion Williamson for a lob for a handoff for a drop off for anything because he's just that dominant and then obviously well he's shooting like 60% and playmaking and doing everything Lonzo Ball shooting lights out a good playmaker good offensive player Brandon Ingram is a consistent 25 5 and 6 the lightning just scared the crap out of me thunder should I say wow but yeah I'm not giving too much credit for offensively being where they should be, uh, like, they're first in the league, but defensively, 
they're a different story. Potential trade options, Larry Nance Jr., I think he would be a perfect fit. He moves his feet. He can play the five. He's a good defender. He's a reason the Cavs were actually having a good season and a reason they've dropped off, a really underrated reason, Larry Nance Jr. He won't come cheaply because, like, he's a really good player. That's the reality of things. They're not going to come cheaply if they're good players. And he's a good player and a really good fit alongside Zion Williamson. So do what you can to make that happen. He's the perfect fit, in my opinion. I've talked about Larry Markin and defensively, that just doesn't help any of their issues. So just get in someone like Larry Nance Jr. He can move his feet laterally. He can stretch the floor. Like, you don't even need someone who can stretch the floor at this point because guys like Zion are just getting their own. Like, they take two or three defenders and that creates offense for everyone. But he can stretch the floor, which helps him even more. And then defensively, he's the perfect piece. He can move his feet. He's better laterally. He can still protect the rim to a degree. He's just a good defender for this team. I would love Larry Nance Jr. on this team. And then potential trade options to get rid of. You've got JJ Redick. He'll go eventually. I just can't imagine him not getting traded. You've got Eric Bledsoe. You're going to have to package up someone to get rid of him. I just don't know what they're doing with Eric Bledsoe. I don't blame them for not having traded them. I don't even know if they can yet because he just got signed. But I, I can't even talk about Eric Bledsoe even anymore. Um, someone like Josh Hart. Yeah, I know Pelicans fans. He's a favorite of a lot of people. He's a good player. I just don't know how valuable he is. He's going to get paid a lot. I see a lot of teams make the mistake of kind of holding on to these guys because they're solid players, but is he a really great fit? Like, I like his hustle. Defensively, I don't know how good he is defensively. Like, he's a solid defender, don't get me wrong, but I don't think he's elite. He's an elite rebounder. It's a weird thing to be at his position and at his size. He's a solid shooter, an okay offensive player, and a pretty good defender but he's going to get paid quite a lot. He's 26, 27, I believe. I just don't know how perfect of a fit he is. I'm not mad at all if you keep him, but these are the kind of decisions you have to make. Sometimes you have to make a hard decision and maybe getting rid of someone like a Josh Hart who looks more valuable right now than he will when he signs a 10 to $15 million contract is the decision you have to make. That's just sometimes the reality of it. So Josh Hart could be someone else going out the door. Steven Adams, if you can find a trade partner for him as well, that would be cool. I'm not trying to get rid of Stan Van Gundy. Don't fire him yet. I'm not advocating a team to fire a head coach this immediately because... Just give it a little bit more time. I agree the playing group isn't up to standard. There's a lot of players that just don't fit particularly well. And it leads to when there's a couple of players that don't fit or don't want to be there, it's a knock-on effect. They don't really have a leader in this locker room. I don't see the veteran presence who actually is commanding players into position. I give Stan Van Gundy a bit of slack for that. I don't think he's been great. I think he's been pretty bad. But I also don't think he's been to the point where you fire him after 40 games because you've got to give him a little bit more time to try and figure some things out. David Griffin hasn't been great either. It's kind of the story of the Pelicans. Just not very good. <laughs> not very good. I hate to tell you Pelicans fans, but yeah, not very good. And I'm quite fed up because they've got too much talent to just be middling out. Not even middling out. They're bottoming middling out. And you've got teams like the Oklahoma City Thunder racking up as many wins, playing Alexei Pokashevsky 30 minutes. Like they're beating teams playing Alexei Pokashevsky 30 minutes. I don't know, man fix it. Thunder and lightning are going crazy right now, so I probably better get off in case anything happens. See ya. Have a good day. Bye.